Hey guys, welcome back. It's your brother in Christ, Weston. Thanks for joining me today. So today's article is going to be over salvation. Let's get into it. Okay. Um, I want to talk about a, a video that I saw from brother Corey Miner talking with brother Dr. Michael Brown, um, or just Michael Brown, who does the Line of Fire YouTube channel. And Corey Miner has a YouTube channel called Smart Christian YouTube or Smart Christian Channels or Smart Christians. Um, and they had a small debate. And uh, Dr. Michael Brown is a Hebrew scholar, but not a Greek scholar, um, regardless that that plays into what I'm going to talk about. Um, and Corey, uh, I believe, knows actually more Greek and has studied more Greek than, than Michael Brown has. Well, Corey brought up a scripture uh, from John 10, 28 through 30. It's one of my favorite scriptures in all, all of the Bible um, because it is so good. And it should, it should give us peace and rest and assurance. And it lines up with all other scriptures talking about this very topic, salvation. What does it mean to be saved in the sense of, can you lose your salvation? Can you not lose your salvation? Now, on this channel, we're going to keep it very biblical. You cannot lose your salvation. The only, the only truth out there is that you cannot lose your salvation. This is 1,000% unequivocal, unequivocally true. You cannot push back on this. You cannot lose it because you, I don't think you even understand, fathom what you're saying. Um, and by any, any, any means that you think you can, you can try to use scripture and say, well, this is what it, this is saying you lose your salvation. I guarantee you, I can prove it wrong by in the same context, or I can find multiple other scriptures that show very clearly, clearly easier to understand. And that show that you cannot lose your salvation based off of just reading it alone, but also based off the Greek um, and based off understanding just God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and how salvation works. So this is a core doctrinal belief to the Christian church, and we cannot get this wrong. Why? Because it's imperative that we understand what it means to be saved by grace, through faith, in Christ, not of yourselves, lest any man should, it's a gift of God, lest any man should boast. Um, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus uh, uh, for good works, prepared before the are prepared that we should walk in them, right? That's Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Uh, yeah, 2, 8, 9. Um, okay, so John 10, 28 through 30 says this. Jesus says, I give them, hard pause. What is he about to give us? Only Jesus could do it. I'm God, I give it. You can't. I give them what? Eternal life. Oh, makes sense. Jesus is the only one that can do that. I can't get eternal life. I can't go out and work for it. I can't seek it. I can't, I can't dig it up. I have to go to somebody for it who then will give it to me if what? If I believe on him, that is salvation by grace through faith. He says, I give them eternal life top down, right? And they shall never perish. Who are the they? The ones that just got eternal life and they shall what? Never perish. So eternal life is existing, meaning that I give them eternal life. They will live forever with me. They shall never perish, meaning they shall never see hell. The person who's perishing in the Bible is always, always 1000%. Somebody who's perished, that is perishing like this, um, is going to be somebody who's died in their sins and who is in hell, okay? Now, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Oh, that makes sense. I've received eternal life from Jesus, so I'm never gonna see hell because I've, I believed on Christ for my salvation. Makes total sense. And they shall never perish. No one is able to snatch them out of my hand, meaning the ones that have been get, the ones that have eternal life are in the hand of Jesus. And you're not God, so there's no way you could snatch yourself out of, your, out of God's hand. And there's no way anybody else could do that against you, right? No demon, no angel, no nothing. It's not happening. Um, if angels and demons are stronger than you, then you, there's no way you could do it. Nobody can do it. Okay. My father who is greater than all has given them to me. Okay. Hard pause. The father gave Jesus the sheep that would believe on him. And then the son has given them eternal life. And by giving them eternal life, that means the spirit has convicted the person of their sin and has uh, brought them to repentance and brought them to salvation. Now he will, uh, come in be uh come inside and he will he will rest upon him come inside of them and they will be born again right so now he lives inside of them right now we're here we are the, the holy spirit has, has come inside my heart and now i am a born again creature he's born me again all right and now i am saved and sealed into the day of redemption i it's a guarantee okay understand the father gave the son did the action and gave eternal life the holy spirit convicts the sinner, right? So one, two, three, the Holy Spirit convicts the sinner with the gospel, with the truth of Jesus, with their sins, brings them to sal brings, brings them to salvation, convicts their heart, opens their heart, and then seals it, okay? My father who is greater than all has given them to me and no one is able to snatch them out of his hand. Now you're in the son's hand and you're in the father's hand. And then he says, I and the father are one. In this, in this just 
28 through 30, in these two lines of text, okay? Jesus says something uh, that we would say, it's called, a, in the Greek, it's called subjunctive of emphatic negation. Emphatically saying, when you, when you in, in emphasize something, you are saying, I am the best Bible reader there ever, ever will ever be. No one is greater than I. I am the best. I am the wisest and the smartest. And there's no one who will do, who will read the Bible like I will. I can read it back and forth. And I know, I know exactly what it says head to toe, right? I am emphatically saying all of those, all of those, those little like filler words, the best, no one will ever be better than me of all time, of all eternity outside of Jesus, right? So let's just say humanly. Um, and then, I, and what is it? The best Bible reader of reading the Bible. That's an emphasizing, modifying, adding to, multiplying, magnifying what? That I'm the best Bible reader. The, Bi I, I, the Bible reader, me. I'm, I'm the, there's, I am, there's no, one, there's no one above me. There will be, never be anybody above me and everybody will be below me, right? I'm just using an example. Um, Jesus says here, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. The never perish is the Greek words here. And I've done a video on this, I believe in the past and probably just this year. Um, but this, I just have to talk about this. Um, it is used, it says, uh, and is Kai. And then when the and goes to the never, it says, me, u me. They shall never perish. So it goes, u me, apalimi, apalimi, apalimi. Yeah, let's see. What, what did it say? Strong's G, 622. Apalimi. 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 So, Strong's G, 3756, ooh. Ooh. Strong's G, 3361, may. 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 So it says, ooh, may, apolly me. Um, you can't see it. You might be able to see it, but it goes, ooh, may, or ooh, may, apolly me. These three right here, right? This is the Blue Letter Bible. This is an emphatic negation to emphasize that the people who have received eternal life will never, ever, 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 the possibility right now or in the future will never happen. They will never perish. They will never see hell. They will never die in their sins. They will never be unsaved. Okay. The Greek for this is here. Um, I think I've given this article before, but we're going to do it uh, again, and I'm going to read it to you as fast as possible, and hopefully you can keep up with me. I know my reader, people I've watched have said, said that yeah, I read too fast. I'm sorry. I'm trying to keep the video short so I can keep you uh, um, uh, uh, keep you here, right? So you won't, I won't, you'll be listening, and then you won't just be off somewhere else, right? I don't want to make this too long for you, so let's read. Um, let's see. Uh, the use of emphatic structure in the Greek is called subjunctive of emphatic negation. The subjunctive of emphatic negation is, without any equivocation, the most emphatic grammatical structure in the Greek New Testament. Okay, he's gonna, they're going to talk about moods here and how things are set in a certain mood. The first mood is called, called indicative mood, the mood of reality. Okay, the mood of reality, which describes events that are actually occurring, occurring that have happened in the past or will actually occur in the future, right? So past, present, and future. Subjunctive mood. This is what we call the mood of probability. So the mood of reality, the mood of probability, which refers to potential future events as probably occurring, but not for, not for certain. Thus, it is used to indicate the potential happenings will occur if actions take place on a conditional basis. Optive mood. The two steps removed from the indicative mood of reality, and thus it is what we call the mood of possibility. So we have mood of reality, mood of probability, mood of possibility. Okay, in this mood, I got my, my work uh, notifications coming up. In this mood, the events described are deeply contingent upon certain events happening in order for them to occur. Thus, there's a greater degree of doubt contained in this mood of an event actually happening than in the subjunctive mood. Imperative mood. This is the mood of volitional possibility, which provides a command for something to be done and is totally dependent upon a person's willingness to accept the command and follow through with it. Thus, it is three steps removed from the indicative mood of reality, and consequently, it expresses the least possibility of something occurring. So the mood of reality, the mood of probability, the mood of possibility, and the mood of volitional possibility. Okay, here it is. Now that we have this, th things are set in certain moods, okay? And they matter. 
negative participles. In Greek, you have particles that express the negative, right? So when I say, you'll never be, you'll never ever be able to open a door the Lord shuts, okay? That I'm saying that in the Greek, I would be saying that this is not a possibility now or ever in the future. You're not gonna be able to do it. Why? Because the Lord has shut it, right? So the emphasis is, is emphatically negating the possibility of this happening ever, adding this emphasizing, magnifying, multiplying it to the next word I'm about to say, the Lord or the, the person, the noun, the Lord, right? Oh, it makes some sense because all, I mean, we're talking about the Lord here, right? So you can't do anything like that. Okay, I get it. It makes sense. You're not gonna be able to do it. Ding, 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 ding. We say this all the time. The angels say this about, the, uh, about God. They say, holy, holy, holy is, here it is, the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. The holies are emphasizing, magnifying, multiplying, uh, um, uh, modifying every holy to stack it upon each other because there's not a greater word than holy. Maybe perfection, but I, I would assume that's also holy. Holy and perfection, are, I would say, are the same. Um, and so, uh, uh, in the sense, when we're talking about God, but holy. They don't use another word. So that is, let's say, the best angelic word or language they have is holy to talk and describe about God. So instead of giving him one holy, maybe they give him three because it's a trinity. Don't know. They say holy, holy, holy. It is to magnify that there's not something greater than this, but there should be. And I can't think of anything. There's not a word that comes to mind that I have at my fingertips or at in my knowledge. So I will use the best word to describe God and I will magnify it upon each other. Meaning he's so holy that he's greater than holy, holy, holy. I don't know what the other word would be or if there is a word out there, but that word and then even above that word, because there's not a word, a word to describe truly how God is outside of saying holy that he's given us, right? And if that's, if that's where the buck stops, then that's the word we would use, just holy. Holy, holy, holy. That's the last word that you can use, the best word to, to talk about God, because that's, how, that's what God has given us in terms of language to describe him. Okay, the negative particles, that's to emphasize and magnify something in the, in, the, in the positive, right? And then there's a negative. Here's the negative. It says here, in the Greek, we have particles that express the negative. Ooh, we just heard it. It says the Greek particle that represents the form of no or not in the English translations, as well as multiple forms of combination that reflect the negative in some form or another. May. The other Greek particle that represents no or not, and it is to a variety of forms that it occurs in reflecting the negative. It's always the negative. However, there is a difference in the application of ou and may, and Thayer explains it quite simply and clearly. Ou and the Septuagint, the particle of negation, refer, differs from ou, which is always an adverb. Uv denies the thing itself or speak technically, deny simply, absolutely, categorically, directly, objectively. But un denies the thought of the thing or the thing according to judgment, opinion, will, purpose, preference, or someone. Hence, as we say technically, indirectly, hypothetically, or subjectively. Why it matters. However, when these two Greek particles, u and may, come together, However, when these two Greek particle particles are combined in a form of ume with reference to a future event, what results is an intensified form of the negative, right? And so this is exactly what I said. The most decisive way of ne negatizing something in the future, Thayer's adds the ume in combination augments the force of the negation and signifies not at all in no wise by no means. However, when this combination is attached and the error is subjunctive, what occurs is what is termed the subjunctive of emphatic negation. As it was pointed out below, the subjunctive mood indicates the probability of an event um, uh, and the aorist tense emphasizes an action as simply occurring without any specific reference to time, apart from the use of the adver adverbial modifier that it would describe the when, where, or how much, or often. Thus, when you have ume in combination with the aorist subjunctive, that's, the, that's, how they, that's the Greek structure, what occurs is the absolute unequivocal denial of the probability of an event ever occurring at any moment or time in the future. I say all that. You can be a doctor and miss this. How? I, I don't know. What I do know is all scripture, God cannot lose a single sheep. Jesus can't lose them. He can't lose them. Let me let me just type it up here. It's John 6. Um, uh, uh, what is it? All that the Father, I should have had this pulled up, gives me, I will lose nothing. Go raise it up on the last day, lose nothing. Um, this is John 6. I love John 6. Um, John 6, 39. 
37 to 39. Um, if this pulls up, it says, Jesus says, all that the father gives me shall come to me and him uh, that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out for I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. And, uh, and this is the will of him who sent me that I should lose none of all those. Oh, come on. Um, all those man, get out of here. This like pop up, pop up back to the main. Um, uh, let me see it. I was literally reading this and then uh, but it says I, that I should not lose those, but raise them up on the last day. Um, an ad popped up so I couldn't read the rest of it. Jesus has, if the father gives the sheep to the son, the father can't make a mistake. Jesus can't make a mistake. But then they'll turn it around and say, well, you walked away. So they didn't make a mistake. It's you walked away. Do you understand what has just happened? The father gave the son sheep that would walk away. Does that even sound like something you want to defend? It doesn't, like, nobody says that. And then on top of that, when we say this, they walked away. But what if they changed their mind? So what if they come back? Can they come back? So they were born again. They, they were dead in their sins and trespasses. Then they were born again. Then they just, they believed, fully believed, and became a true believer, were a true sheep. And Jesus gave them eternal life, and they should never perish. And the Father gave the Son this sheep, all right? And he can't lose them. Then they leave. So now he's lost them. And the, the implications of what we just said, the father gave him a false sheep. That doesn't make any sense. And the Holy Spirit convicted him of his sins. And the Holy Spirit was for sure that he was a full sheep, a believer, and then came upon him and he was born again. So the Holy Spirit made a mistake. And then Jesus didn't do the will of the father because he lost the sheep. You walked away. And then you're what? Unborn. So the Holy Spirit leaves you. And then now you're dead again. You're 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 dead, dead again, or unborn again, again. And then let's say you believe again. Now are you born, reborn again, again? Or are we reborn again one time, times two? So then the Holy Spirit comes back and then the Father hands you, hands Jesus back. Do you see what I'm saying? All of this matters. It so matters. Because anybody who starts to talk about you have to do something, you, in my mind, doesn't mean it's true, in my mind, this is in my opinion. You have backdoor works involved. You have man's responsibility somewhere involved with maintaining your salvation. But Jesus said, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one is able to snatch them out of my hand. Meaning your salvation is sustained by Jesus. You'll always be in his hand. You're in his care. You're his flock. He's your shepherd. You're in his care. You couldn't earn the salvation. What makes you think you can maintain it? What makes you think that you can sustain it? You can be a doctor and miss this. And I want you guys to understand, not everybody who just hops on a platform, who's got accolades, doctors, this, that, and the third, it doesn't matter. The, the disciples were unlearned, okay? In the ways of Jesus, right? And my, you know, my good friend, um, Jared, reminded me of this. Like, yeah, absolutely, you're right. Um, but we can have this mindset that when people, I've said this before, I've said this another day, people put on a white coat, people trust them, right? Because they've done, they've done the research and I'm like, okay, yeah, maybe I should listen to you, right? You know, when we talked about this and where we're like two sides, there's two sides of white coats and one saying one thing and one saying another, why would the other like try to go against this one? There's so many red flags. You should pay attention to both parties. Um, but it's so evident and so clear in scripture that you cannot lose your salvation based off all of scripture, based off of who God is and the things he's done, there's no scripture that even indicates that you could lose it off of your willingness to give it give it up. It, there's none, there's none, there's none. There's no way the Father and the Son and, and the Spirit are making a mistake by having the plan of salvation laid upon you and then you're giving it up. I, I don't have a word for this, but to me, uh, man, I, I don't know. I, I don't know, but this is my opinion. Um, I don't know if you should be teaching. I, I, I don't know if you should be doing that unless you are clear. This is gospel oriented. This is talking about salvation. Nobody cares about anything at the rest of the day unless you're saved. Because if you have to take your salvation into question, that is scary. That is terrifying. And I want people to understand when we read the Greek here, it is so abundantly clear. I am not a scholar, but I'll tell you what I would think I'm scholarly in or have a scholarly mind of or have been given wisdom about and understanding because I've battled and wrestled with this topic so many times. It's salvation. 
and how Jesus secures it and being secure in my salvation, that there's nothing that I can do, nothing. I wouldn't want to do it in the first place, but regardless, there's nothing. You can have peace, peace and rest and assurance of your salvation because of who Jesus is, because of what the Father's done, because of what Jesus has done, and because of what the Holy Spirit has done. And to think that man could corrupt that or manipulate that when he's done that his entire life, salvation is not something you can touch. It's not a work you can touch or manipulate. That's the great thing about it. Anyways, guys, that's the video. Let me know what y'all think, and I'll see you in the next one.